Hey, 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 and welcome back for the second part of the chapter 11 lecture. We're still talking about solutions, aqueous solutions mainly. Um, and in this part of the chapter, we're going to learn all about colligative properties. Colligative properties. Now these are properties that depend on the number of particles in solution. So not on the identity, though we'll see where identity plays a role right at the end, but um, it really doesn't matter what the solute is, it just matters how many particles of the solute are in there, okay? So the four colligative properties, one, two, three, four, is vapor pressure lowering. I've got some um, cafe music going in the background. I don't know if you can hear. <laughs> Trying to drown out my family downstairs. Boiling point elevation. Um, freezing point lowering or freezing point depression. And lastly, osmotic pressure. All right, so these are the four different colligative properties that we're going to talk about. So the first one is vapor pressure lowering. So before we talk about vapor pressure lowering, let's first just do a little refresher what vapor pressure is. So vapor pressure is the pressure that a gas um, coming off of a liquid exerts exerts in a closed container. So you have this um, container here, it's got a lid. All right, you put some liquid in it, let's say it's water, this is water actually, these are water molecules, um, and you close it and water will evaporate. Um, some water molecules will evaporate into that air space above the liquid. And after it's been closed for a while, it'll ultimately reach a dynamic equilibrium where the same number of water molecules are evaporating as are condensing back into the liquid. And um, at normal atmospheric pressure, that the pressure, it will, it will basically reach normal atmospheric pressure. Um, if we pressurize it, then that's different. So for any given um, liquid, okay, the weaker the intermolecular forces are, the higher the vapor pressure is. Think of it as these um, mo like the molecules in the liquid have very weak attractions with each other, so it's really easy for them to ditch each other and go into the gas stage. So they have a higher vapor pressure. More of those molecules will be in the gas stage. So or substances that have very weak intermolecular forces and a high vapor pressure, we call those volatile substances. Uh, substances with stronger intermolecular forces have a lower vapor pressure, and we call these non-volatile substances. So in this diagram right here, just kind of showing you the difference, um, substances that have strong intermolecular forces have very few, relatively few molecules that go into the gas phase and they have a low vapor pressure versus those with weak intermolecular forces. More of these molecules go into the gas phase and it has a, a higher vapor pressure. So let's start by talking about these non-volatile solutes. So for non-volatile solutes, the vapor pressure of the solution is going to be lower. Oops, I've got a cap in my way. Is going to be lower than the vapor pressure of a pure solvent. So if this is our pure solvent here on the left, all right, and we do have um, molecules of, of this of this pure liquid going into the vapor phase. That's what these little dots are here in the vapor phase. Okay, when there's a solute dissolved in that liquid, less of those molecules go into the vapor phase. And you can kind of think of these 
um, these plus signs representing the solute as sort of blocking, they kind of block those molecules from escaping. And that's why the vapor pressure is lower in a solution than it is in a pure solvent. All right, so there is a sort of mathematical law that governs this that we can use to calculate the vapor pressure um, it, it given off by a solution, and that is called Raoult's Law, R-A-O-U-L-T, Raoult's Law. And Raoult's Law is the pressure of the solution equals the mole fraction of the solvent times the vapor pressure of that pure solvent. All right, so just to label these, P solution is the vapor pressure of the solution. This is the mole fraction of the solvent, and this is the vapor pressure of pure solvent with nothing dissolved in it. So let's do a practice problem with Raoult's Law. Calculate the vapor pressure at 25 degrees Celsius of a solution containing 55.3 grams of sucrose and 285 grams of water. So I like to draw my pictures. So we've got water. We have 285 grams of water and we're adding, here's my spoon, adding some sucrose. We're gonna add 55.3 grams of sucrose. Um, and we want to know once we make that solution what the vapor pressure of it will be. And it tells us the vapor pressure of pure water, the vapor pressure of pure water is 23.8 torr. Okay, so I want to know what is the vapor pressure of the solution. So if I'm given these vapor pressures, I know I want to use Raoult's Law, so I'm just going to write it out. The pressure of the solution, which is what I'm trying to find, equals the mole fraction of the solvent times the pressure of the pure solvent, which is water in this case. So what do I have? Do a little color coding here. So I have this is given to me in the problem. All right. Now I need this here, the mole fraction. And remember mole fraction, that's gonna be moles of solvent over total moles. So I need to know how many moles I have. I didn't, did, they didn't give me moles, they gave me grams, but they also gave me the identity so I can calculate the moles of each of these things. And that's what I'm gonna do next. So I'm going to, um, we'll go to red. All right, so next thing I wanna do is I wanna do 55.3 grams of sucrose. I'm going to divide by the molar mass of sucrose, which I can calculate from the formula. Or if I'm feeling lazy, I can look it up. It is 342 grams, oops, equals 0 0.162 moles of sucrose. Um, that's our solute. And now our solvent of water, 285 grams, divided by 18.02 grams, the molar mass of water, is a total of 15.8 moles of water. So now I can add these two together to get my total moles. This is total, this is of water, and this is of sucrose. So my total moles when added together comes out to be 15.962, and that's extra sig figs, but that's okay for now, we're not done yet. So now I can use um, these numbers to find my mole fraction. Um, the moles of the solvent 
it's 15.8 moles of water, that's our solvent, over the total moles, 15.962. So our mole fraction, which has no units, is 0 0.9898. That's what I got. So now I have everything I need for this equation. So the pressure of the solution, go back to blue here. The pressure of the solution is, I'm gonna do some color coding, zero, nope, zero point nine eight nine eight times, Twenty three point eight, and our answer is drum roll twenty three point six. And our units are tor because that's what we were given. So you can see that the pure solvent, water, has a pressure of twenty three point eight, and now with the sugar dissolved in it, the sucrose dissolved in it, it has gone down a little bit. Vapor pressure lowering. It didn't go down significantly, but it did go down for sure. All right, let's try another one. Calculate the vapor pressure at 25 degrees Celsius of a 35% mass by volume solution of sucrose in water. So now we have a solution of sucrose in water, and it's a 35% solution, that mass over volume. So th another way we could write that is um, 35 grams per 100 milliliters. And that's 35 grams of sucrose per 100 milliliters of solution, all right? Um, the vapor pressure of pure water is 23.8 torr. Assume the density of the solution to be 1.08 grams per milliliter. And what did it ask for? Oh, the vapor pressure of the solution. So we wanna know, that's what we're trying to find, the vapor pressure of the solution. All right, so still, we're using Raoult's law. We need to do pressure of solution equals the mole fraction of the solvent times the pressure of pure water. And I'll say that our, our solvent is water, so we'll say the mole fraction of water Okay, so we know the this value, it was given to us in the problem, and we need to find the mole fraction of water. This time it didn't give us masses though, it gave us a different set of conditions that we need to use to find the mole fraction. So we need to know the moles. We need to know the moles of water and we need to know the moles of sucrose, so we need to know the total moles. So how are we gonna do that? We have been given a percent concentration, and we can pick a random amount. We can say we, we just can say we have 100 milliliters of this solution so that we can calculate a mass and uh, or the number of moles that we would have in that volume. Because it doesn't matter what volume of liquid we have, the vapor pressure is a constant. So the vapor pressure, whether whether you had 10 milliliters or 100 milliliters in a container, the vapor pressure would still be the same. So for water at 25 degrees Celsius, no matter how much water you have in the container, the, it'll equilibrate at a vapor pressure of 23.8 torr. So that's why we can pick a volume. So we're gonna pick 100 because that's the easiest. I'm gonna pick 100 because that's the easiest. So um, that means we have 100 milliliters of solution. And um, the 
solution is has a density of 1.08 grams per milliliter. So that means we have 108 grams of solution. Well, that doesn't, we don't really need to do anything with that, but we might need, we are gonna need this number, so hang in there with me. Next thing I'm gonna do is figure out um, how many moles we have in that 35 grams of sucrose. Oh, actually, no, we're gonna use this number right now. Okay, so we don't need to know the total grams of solution, but we do need to know the total number of grams of water because we need to know how many moles of water we ultimately have. And so we can use this because we know that we have, um, in that 100 mils, we have 35 grams of sucrose. So 108 minus 35 grams is 70, what is it? 73, 73 grams of water. So this number we can use to calculate our moles of water. So now um, we're going to, we'll just do that right here then. One mole is 18.02 grams. So how many moles of water is that? That's 4.05 grams of water. And our sucrose divided by its molar mass of 342 tells us that we have 0 0.102 moles of sucrose. All right, so um, I'm going to just neaten this up a little bit. So for the mole fraction that we're trying to find, the mole fraction is moles of water over moles total. All right, our moles of water, oops, this is not grams, this is moles, is 4.05 moles. And our moles total is going to be the moles of water plus the moles of sucrose, which ends up being 4.152. So when we do our division here, we get a mole fraction of, let's see if I can squeeze this in, 0 0.976 is the mole fraction that I get. So that's the mole fraction that we're gonna plug in here. So now we have our mole fraction, so now, on the bottom here, I'm gonna plug in, I'm gonna solve for, what just happened? I picked the wrong writing device. Grr, I want blue. All right, the pressure of the solution is the mole fraction. In this case, we solve that to be 0.976 times the pressure of the pure solvent, which we were given is 23.6 torr. So the pressure of the solution equals 23.2 torr. So in this case, it went down a little bit more than before. It went, um, the previous problem, it only went down by two tenths of a torr, and this time it went down by four tenths of a torr. But a key thing in these problems is we know that adding a solute results in vapor pressure lowering. So if somehow we got an answer that was higher than 23.6, we know we went, you know, something happened weird in our calculations. Another thing is the mole fraction should always be less than one. It's a percent of the total or a, a proportion of the total. So if you get a mole fraction greater than one, again, there's some error in your calculations that you need to find. So those are just some like mental math checks to do. So that's for non-volatile solutions. So those are solutions where the solute is not, um, or for, they, that's for non-volatile solutes. 
where the solute does not emit a vapor pressure, like sugar and salt. They don't emit vapor pressure. All right, but some solutes do emit a vapor pressure. Um, the classic example would be ethanol. So if liquid A was ethanol and liquid B here was water and you mix them together, all right, both, you would find both of those molecules in the vapor. And so the vapor pressure above the solution is gonna be the vapor pressure, uh, will be the vapor pressure of each of those added together. Um, so how do we, find the vapor pressure of each one, the vapor pressure of each one follows Routes law. So the pressure of A, let's say that's ethanol, is going to equal the mole fraction of ethanol, or A, whatever substance A is, times the vapor pressure of that pure substance. And same thing for B, whatever liquid B is, the mole fraction of B times the, par the pressure of pure B. All right, and then we also would use Dalton's law, which um, we learned back in the gas laws chapter, which is that the total pressure over the solution here is just going to be the pressure of A, or the partial pressure of A plus the partial pressure of B. So these equations are ones that we're using when we are dealing with volatile solutes. And so in an ideal solution, this in the center here is describing our ideal. So in an ideal solution, the solvent, so the solute and the solvent attractions to each other are equal to the attractions that they have to themselves. So it's like, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other, whether they have intermolecular forces with each other or with themselves. And so in ideal mixing, oh man, I mixed these up. Shoot. Well, this is the positive deviation graph. I made this picture and I was so proud of it. And this is the ideal mixing graph. So sorry about that. Okay, so um, this here is what it would look like ideally. So as the amount, the number of moles of A, whatever salt, whatever liquid A is, let's just pretend it's ethanol, okay? The more ethanol that we have in that mixture, the higher the pres partial pressure of ethanol will be. And the more ethanol we have, the less water we'll have. And so the partial pressure of B goes down as the partial pressure of A goes up. And so um, if we calculate what the total pressure is, it follows this sort of, this line here. Um, Ta-da! And that's for an ideal solution. Some solutions do behave ideally. And when we talk about something behaving ideally, we mean it follows the equation perfectly. So with gases, we said there's the ideal gas law um, for gases behaving ideally. And in the case of gases, most of them do behave ideally, um, especially when it's warm um, and low pressure, but they start to behave not ideally at higher pressures and lower temperatures. Um, in the case of solutions, they act non-ideally when they have either really strong intermolecular forces between the two different liquids or the two different substances, or they have really weak interactions between the two, like they're not very soluble in each other. Um, so, and those cause deviations in the expected calculations. So we, would, we can do the ideal calculations and figure out what the ideal um, pressure would be if they behaved ideally, but when we measure it, we'll see a deviation. If there's very weak attractions, all right, remember weak attractions have higher vapor pressure, so we would see a positive deviation. Um, so the, the actual measured pressure would be a little bit higher than what we expected. And if there's very strong um, interactions between them or intermolecular forces, then we would see a negative deviation. So the pressure that we calculate would be less, or the pressure that we measure would be less than what we calculated. So let's do a practice problem. 
a solution of benzene, which is C6H6, and toluene, C7H8, is 25% benzene by mass. Um, the vapor pressure of pure benzene and toluene, well, um, before I keep reading, I'm just going to go ahead and start drawing down some stuff. So it gives me the uh, formula, so I'm going to go ahead and write out the mol molar masses for these. For benzene, it is, if I calculate 6 times 12.01 plus 6, it ends up being 78.12 grams per mole. And for toluene, the molar mass is 92.15 grams per mole. Okay, the vapor pressure of pure benzene and toluene is 94.2 and 28.4 respectively. Okay, so the vapor pressure of pure benzene, benzene is 94.2 torr, and the vapor pressure of pure toluene is 28.4 torr. Um, Okay, and we have a 25% solution. It's 25% by mass. So mass over mass. And that can also be written as 25 grams of benzene per my cat is in my way. No, just kidding. Cancel. Cancel my undo. Okay. Cats. 25 grams of benzene per 100 grams of solution. All right. And if we have a hundred grams of solution with 25 of those grams being benzene it means that 75 grams is toluene all right so we've got 25 grams of benzene and 75 grams of toluene awesome um and we want to know we want to calculate the pressure of each i'm going to do this in red here i'm going to write what we're looking for we want to know the pressure of each so we want to know the pressure of benzene and the pressure of toluene and the total pressure over the solution. All right, so we're gonna need to find each of these and then add them together to get the pressure of the solution. So I wanna use Raoult's law to find the pressure of each of these. Mm. A little scan in my notes here. I already did these calculations. Okay. <laughs> Guys, you can't see my tech over here just going nuts with my cat. Okay. Let's try this one more time. I need like Jeopardy music. Okay. There we go. All right. So I'm going to start with, let's start with benzene. Why not? So for benzene, the pressure of benzene is going to equal the mole fraction of benzene times the pressure of pure benzene. Um, so to get the mole fraction, we need to know how many moles we have. We have 25 grams of benzene. The molar mass of benzene is 78.12 grams. So that's a total of 0 0.320 moles of benzene. Great, okay, now we need the moles of toluene. And the moles of toluene, 75 grams of toluene 
divided by the molar mass of 92.15 grams gives us 0 0.814 moles of toluene. Toluene, that's what I'm gonna call it. And if we add these together, our total number of moles is 1.13 moles total. So now I have the information for my mole fractions. So for the partial pressure of benzene, it's going to be um, the moles of benzene, 0 0.320 over the total moles, 1.13 times the pressure of pure benzene, which if I scroll up a little bit, was 94.2 and the pressure of toluene is the mole fraction 0.814 moles divided by 1.13 moles times the pressure of pure toluene. So the pressure of benzene that I calculate is 26.7 torr, and the pressure of toluene ends up being 20.4 torr, and the total pressure, or I should say the pressure of the solution, the pressure of the solution is just the sum of those two. And that is 47.1 torr. So those were the three things that it asked us to solve for, the pressure of benzene, the pressure of toluene, and the pressure of the complete solution. So now there's a follow-up question. Oh, I gave us lots of room to do that. And I didn't use it all. All right, if the experimentally measured total pressure is 46.2 torr, so this is measured, what can you conclude about the benzene toluene attractions? Well, what we calculated was 47.1 torr. All right, this is essentially what it would be if this was an ideal solution, but it's not because it's not, we don't measure it to be 47.1. What we measured it to be 46.2 is less than 47.1. So if the vapor pressure is less than the ideal, okay, um, it means that the attractions between the two are very strong. So since um, the measured vapor pressure is less, than ideal, um, benzene really, really, really loves toluene. <laughs> In other words, they have strong attractions. They have very strong attractions with each other. Okay. So that is vapor pressure and a couple of problems dealing with vapor pressure lowering of solutes of solutions. Um, and the second colligative property that we'll talk about is boiling point elevation. So my mnemonic for this, how I remember boiling point elevation is silly because I, when I first started teaching these, um, I'd always get confused. I couldn't remember. Is it boiling point elevation or boiling point depression? Is it freezing point elevation? So this is my mnemonic and this is how I remember it. So I remember that in the, in the sun, in the summertime, when it's hot, all right, and things are boiling hot, all right, you're happy. Everybody likes sunny weather, okay? So your mood is elevated. So your mood is elevated in the summer when it's hot. And so boiling point is elevated. Boiling point elevation goes up, just like your mood goes up when it's hot. 
All right, so the boiling point, the definition of boiling point is it's the temperature at which the liquid's vapor pressure equals its external pressure, which is generally atmospheric pressure. So there's always atmospheric pressure pushing down, right? That's what these yellow arrows are. There's 14 point, was it 14.7 pounds per square inch of air actually pushing on you at all times. It's just the weight of the atmosphere of all, of the, you know, like however many a mile or two of, of air that's on top of us. And we don't feel it. Um, so in order for a liquid to boil, it has to be heated to a point where the vapor pressure exerted by the, the liquid is equal to the vapor pressure of the atmosphere. And at that point, gas bubbles will start forming. They can start spontaneously forming. So that's why, that's what, what, bubbling, what boiling is. Um, so the higher this pressure is, the higher the boiling point will be. So boiling point is directly proportional to atmospheric pressure. The higher uh, um, so the harder it, yeah, oh, I just lost my train of thought, sorry. Um, okay, so the boiling point of a solution, all right, is going to have a lower vapor pressure. And so it's going to need to be heated even more in order to increase that pressure to match the atmospheric pressure. So since a solute dissolved in solution lowers vapor pressure, it raises the boiling point. Um, vapor pressure and boiling point are inversely related. When one goes up, the other goes down. So um, the equation that we're gonna use to calculate how much the boiling point is elevated is this one right here. So it's the change in temperature of the boiling point. Um, so we'll call it TB for temperature, the boiling point, is equal to the molality of the solution times a constant called the boiling point constant, Kb. And the boiling point constant is in the units of degrees Celsius per molality. And you can find this on a table. Find these values on a table. I'll provide them in these problems, but the last page of these notes actually contains that table for some common solvents. All right. Um, so the, to find the boiling point of a solution, we find the change in boiling point and we add it to the boiling point of the pure solvent. So another way to just sort of write this out mathematically is the boiling point of the solution is equal to the boiling point of the pure solvent plus that however many degrees change, okay? So when we're doing these problems, we can't forget to do this step here. All right, this first example problem says, calculate the boiling point, BP, I mean boiling point, of a 2.5 molal ethylene glycol aqueous solution. Ethylene glycol, by the way, is antifreeze that you put like in your car and stuff. Um, and it gives us the Kb of water, the, um, and uh, this should be a lowercase k. It's at, that's actually important. It should be a lowercase k. So the boiling point constant of water, it gives us. So we can calculate the change in temperature of the boiling point by doing this equation here. And we were conveniently given all of these values. So the change in boiling point is just the molality, 2.50 molal times the um, boiling point constant, 0.512 degrees Celsius per molal. And that equals 1.28 degrees Celsius. So the boiling point of this solution is going to be the boiling point of, it's an aqueous solution. So the normal boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. And we're now adding 1.28 degrees Celsius. So our new boiling point is 1. 
101 and we need it to be at three sig fig, so I'm just gonna stop there. I'm gonna round it here. 101 degrees Celsius, boom. What mass of ethylene glycol must you add to one kilogram of water to produce a solution that boils at 105 degrees Celsius? This problem's a little bit more complicated. So it's, um, we're making an aqueous solution. So we're making a solution of ethylene glycol in water. We know that the normal boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. Um, and we want to have a solution boiling point of 105 degrees Celsius. So that is a change in boiling point temperature of five degrees Celsius. Um, and we want to know what mass of ethylene glycol that we need to add to one kilogram of water. Okay, so we're gonna use this equation, so I'm gonna write this one out for the change in boiling point. Molality times the constant, the boiling point constant of water, which we can look up on a table or in the previous problem. So that is 0 0.512 degrees Celsius per molality. Um, and we know, so we know the Kb here. We also know we just calculated the change in temperature here is five degrees Celsius. So we can solve for molality, which we're gonna need to do because after this, we're going to need to use the equation for molality. And molality is of course moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. And it does give us one kilogram of water. Um, I'm gonna say mass of water one kilogram. So we know that, so I'm gonna check that off too. We already have this information. So we're gonna get, first find the molarity, the molality, sorry. Um, plug that in here so that we can find the moles of the solute. And then once we know the moles of the solute, we can use the molar mass to figure out grams, because that's ultimately what we wanna do. We wanna find the mass of ethylene glycol. So now we can do, do this math. So the first thing I wanna do is use this equation here. And I'm gonna rearrange it. Um, so molality equals change in temperature over the, te the boiling point constant. The change in temperature is five degrees Celsius and the boiling point constant, 0.512 degrees Celsius per molality. Our molality is 9.77 molal. Awesome. Now I can use that in this equation here. So um, again, I'm going to do a little rearranging of this equation so I can solve for moles of solute. And that's going to equal the molality times the kilograms of solvent, which is our water. And the molality we just calculated is 9.77 mole. And we were conveniently given one kilogram of water. So our, our moles of solute is 9.77 moles. All right. And then lastly, if I have 9.77 moles, um, the third thing I'm going to do is multiply it by the molar mass to get the mass of ethylene glycol. So, oops, one mole of ethylene glycol, um, which I can calculate the molar mass, and it is 62.5. 06 grams 62.06 grams 
equals 606 grams of ethylene glycol. So if we have a kilogram of water and we want to make a solution that will boil at a slightly higher temperature of 105 degrees Celsius, we need 606 grams of ethylene glycol to add to that water. All right, so those are boiling point elevation problems. The third colligative property is freezing point depression. And the way I remember freezing point depression, the same way that I remember, so, um, in the winter, when it's cold, a lot of people are sad and depressed, right? Seasonal affective disorder is a real thing. Okay, so seasonal depression. Actually, this guy looks angry. It's just supposed to be sad. There. Uh, <laughs> so freezing point depression, you're depressed when you're cold. So it's freezing point depression and you're happy or your mood is elevated when you're hot, so it's boiling point elevation. That's my silly mnemonic for you, and I won't kick it anymore. All right, so the freezing point of a solution, it, depression means lower, so the freezing point of a solution is lower than the freezing point of a pure solvent. And again, this has to do with the solute particles sort of blocking those solvent um, particles. So if you have pure water um, in a liquid form and then you cool it down, it is going to arrange, the, those water molecules are going to arrange themselves into a crystal structure that is the solid. Okay, they're all going to um, come together. But when you have a solute mixed in, the solute kind of gets in the way of the ice crystal floor formation and so it takes more cooling. You have to slow it down even more in order to create that those ice crystals. All right, and in the in between, you get this sort of slushy material where there's some ice crystals forming, but then there's salt kind of blocking those ice crystals. So that's why we use salt to melt snow on sidewalks and stuff. So the equation to figure out to calculate freezing point depression is actually almost the same as um, for boiling point elevation. The change in freezing point, so we'll have a little F there, is equal to the molality times the freezing point constant of a substance. So since it's freezing point depression, we have to remember that the freezing point of a solution, of a solution, all right, is going to be equal to the freezing point of the, the normal um, freezing point of the solvent minus that change in temperature. So for boiling point, we add, and for freezing point, we subtract. So let's do a straightforward problem here. Calculate the freezing point of a 1.7 molal aqueous solution of ethylene glycol, and the Kf of water is 1.86. So the change in temperature in the freezing point is going to be the molality times the freezing point constant. The molality is 1.7 and the freezing point constant is 1.86. Our molalities cancel and we get 3.162 degrees Celsius. So now that's not our new freezing point. Our freezing point is going to be equal to the freezing point, the normal freezing point of water, which is zero, plus our, or sorry, minus, minus 3.162 degrees Celsius for a new freezing point of negative 3.162 degrees Celsius. And this is why we use ethylene glycol as antifreeze, because when you add it to water, it lowers the freezing point so your car fluids don't freeze up in the winter. Um, in New York, in the winter, we need to add a little more ethylene glycol than this, a little higher than a 1.7 um, molal solution. This problem here, a little bit 
a little bit next level. How many moles of ethylene glycol must you add to 500 grams of water to make a solution with a freezing point of negative 15 degrees Celsius? A little, a little more appropriate maybe for the area. So if we want the new freezing point, so if we want the freezing point to be equal to negative 15 degrees, the freezing point of the solution, of course, is going to be the freezing point of the normal minus the change, right? So if we want our freezing point to be negative 15 degrees Celsius, and it's an aqueous solution, we're mixing it in water, the normal freezing point of water is zero degrees minus some change, all right? So that change, our change in temperature here is 15 degrees. That was sort of a long way of saying that, but our change in temperature that we desire is 15 degrees. So then if we use this equation for change in temperature, or change at freezing point temperature, times the molality times the freezing point constant, um, we don't know the molality. We do know, in this case, we do know this. And we do know this, so we're solving for the molality. So I'm just gonna rearrange it. The molality is the change in freezing point divided by the freezing constant. Our change in temperature is 15 degrees and our freezing point constant, I'm just gonna take from the previous problem here, 1.86 degrees Celsius per molality, and I get a molality of 8.06 molo, or another way to view that is 8.06 moles of ethylene glycol per kilogram of water, because that's what molo means. It means moles per kilogram. So I can use this molality now, along with this volume, to figure out how many moles of ethylene glycol I want to use. I'm basically using this equation here. Molality equals moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. And I know my kilograms of solvent because I have 500 grams of water, which is 0 0.500 kilograms. So I know my mass of the mass of the solvent. And I just calculated the molality here. So now I can solve for moles of solute. So I'm just going to rearrange this equation. Moles of solute. Yeah, I'm going to do it this way. I was thinking about doing it with dimensional analysis. So I'm just gonna return that to normal. Molal. All right, so moles of solute equal the molality times the kilograms of solvent. And the molality is 8.06 molal and the kilograms of solvent 0 0.5 kilograms. So we need 4.03 grams of ethylene glycol in that 500 grams of water if we want a solution with a freezing point of negative 15 degrees Celsius. So we've gone through three of the four colligative properties. The last one is osmotic pressure. So osmosis, the definition of osmosis is it's the flow of water through a semi-permeable membrane from a solution of high concentration to an, a solution of low concentration. And I wrote that but from a solution of, uh, nope, I, sorry, I just gave you the definition of diffusion verbally. The one in here is correct. So osmosis is the opposite. In some ways, it's the opposite of diffusion. So it's really the diffusion of water. So if we look at these two solutions in this U-tube here, 
Um, YouTube, I just said YouTube. <laughs> okay, water over here, and here is water plus, I don't know, let's say sugar, okay? Those green balls are sugar molecules. So the solution with the higher concentration, remember concentration is the amount of solute in solution. So this solution, the solution has the higher solute concentration and the um, one on the left has the lower solute concentration. Okay, so, but if we look at the amount of water in each solution, the pure solvent has more water than the solution does. And so water diffuses. It moves from an area of high water to an area of lower water. But we tend to talk about things in by their concentration. So osmosis often sounds like it's the opposite of diffusion because it's going from the area from the solution of lower concentration to the area of higher concentration because we're talking about solute the solute concentration, okay? So when you have pure water and then you have a solution next to it, um, water is going to move towards that higher concentration solution. Essentially, I think of it as like the water is trying to dilute it. They're trying to equilibrate. They're trying to get to an equal, um, equal concentrations. So the water will move over to the other side of that membrane, but as it does that, this level of fluid rises in the right side of the tube here, okay? And eventually the pressure of this extra water up here um, pushing down on the, ultimately on the membrane and the water molecules trying to move in is equal to the pressure of those water molecules trying to move in. So we call this pressure the osmotic pressure. It's how we measure the pressure of those water molecules moving in. We measure the pressure of the, of the liquid here that stops the osmotic flow. So as we increase the concentration of solute in a solution, we increase the osmotic pressure. So the more solute we put in this side of the tube, the more water will move over and the larger this osmotic pressure will be. So the formula to calculate osmotic pressure is pi, this is a capital pi, as in like the pi we use for circles, 3.14, but it's not, this is not 3.14 because lowercase pi is 3.14. Um, uppercase pi is our placeholder here for osmotic pressure. So this is, pi is the Greek letter P, so it's basically just P, pressure. I don't know why we have to use pi. I don't know why we can't just use P. Or like PO for osmotic pressure. I don't know, guys. Um, MRT, pi, pi equals MRT, or osmotic pressure equals the molarity times the gas constant, the ideal gas constant, 0.0821 liters atmospheres per moles Kelvin um, times the temperature. All right, notice guys, if we replace that pi with a P, what we really have is Pivnert in disguise because molarity is moles per volume. So moles per volume, if we move this down here, all right, this is basically just Pivnert. Um, we're using gas laws here. Osmotic pressure is just Pivnert. All right, so let's calculate the osmotic pressure in atmospheres of a solution containing 1.5 grams of ethylene glycol and 50 milliliters of solution. So our solution is, we have 50 milliliters, that's the volume. And in that 50 milliliters dissolved in that is 1.5 grams of our solute. And we wanna know what is the osmotic pressure. 
So let's write the formula for osmotic pressure. It's molarity times the gas constant times the temperature in Kelvin. Remember when we are using PivNert, we're always using temperature in Kelvin and that's because our ideal gas constant has unit of Kelvin and we need those units to cancel out. So 25 plus 273, I'm converting that to Kelvin, is gonna be 298 Kelvin. So I've got my temperature. I'm just gonna like do my little check marks here. So um, I know the temperature. I'm given that. I always know the co gas constant. That's a given. All right, um, I want to find I'm trying to find the um, osmotic pressure, so I need to know molarity. So what is molarity? Molarity is moles of solute over liters of solution. Can Do I have what I need to solve for that? So I do have a volume of solution here. It's 50 milliliters, but I want it in liters, so I can just do a quick conversion there in my head. So I do know the liters of solution, check. Um, what about the moles of solute? Do I know the moles of solute? I can find that out pretty easily because I have the mass, 1.5 grams of ethylene glycol, divided by the molar mass, of ethylene glycol, which we used in a previous problem, and it was, what was it? 62.06. So that means we have 0 0.0242 moles of our solute. All right, so now I've found moles of solute. Yay, so I have my molarity and I can plug it in here and I can find the osmotic pressure. So the molarity, oh, oops, I guess I should finish solving the molarity. So the molarity is 0 0.0242 moles over 0 0.05 liters for a molarity of 0 0.4 Three molar. So 0 0.483 molar times 0 0.0821 liter atmosphere per mole Kelvin. So our moles per liter cancel out and times the temperature of 298 Kelvin Kelvins cancel out and our pressure is going to be in the units of atmospheres. When we do the multiplication, we get an answer of 11.8. 11.8 atmospheres is the osmotic pressure of that solution. All right, so those are the four colligative properties. Um, and those are the colligative properties as we've talked about them for things that don't dissociate in solution. We've really this whole time been talking about the colligative properties of non-electrolytes. So just a refresher of electrolytes and non-electrolytes. An example of, of a non-electrolyte is glucose. So glucose does not dissociate in solution. In other words, it doesn't ionize, doesn't break apart. So this is solid glucose, the formula for solid glucose. When we add it to water, I'll put a little water over here above the arrow. Okay, this is what it becomes. All right, same formula. It's the same molecule, except now it's in the aqueous form. Ethanol, same deal. Ethanol is liquid. When we mix it in water, it dissolves in water and it becomes aqueous but it doesn't break apart, doesn't form ions. It's still the same molecule. It's just now evenly dissociated, uh, or it's not dissociated, evenly dispersed throughout the solution. Okay, so with non-electrolytes, um, when we dissolve ethanol in water, 
for one mole of ethanol, we get one mole of particles. Every ethanol particle forms one, every ethanol molecule is just one particle dissolved in water, okay? But electrolytes dissociate in solution. In other words, they, they come apart into their ions. So when we add salt, salts, soluble salts to water, they um, dissociate into their ions. So sodium chloride comes apart and forms sodium ions and chloride ions, right? And magnesium chloride will dissociate to form magnesium ions. Magnesium has a two plus charge that are aqueous and chloride ions, in this case, two of them that are aqueous. So when we dissolve these electrolytes in solution, we end up with more than one particle. So for every um, unit of sodium chloride, we end up with two particles of solute um, in, in solution. And for one mole or one unit of magnesium chloride, we end up with three particles floating around in the water. Okay, and since colligative properties by definition depend on the number of particles in solution, we have to account for those extra particles when we're dealing with electrolytes. All right, so um, the way that we do that is through a value called the Van't Hoff factor, and it's a, a lowercase i. We call it the Van't Hoff factor. All right, and it's basically just a measure of how many particles we get when we when we have an electrolyte. So for all non-electrolytes, all right, the the Van't Hoff factor is one. It's just one. Um, we dissolve sugar in water. For every one sugar molecule we dissolve, we end up with one sugar molecule dissolved. But for salts, it's not quite so. So for sodium chloride, we said we would expect um, it has a, uh, it dissolves into two particles, right? Or dissociates into two particles. Okay, but when we measure it in honesty, we get a measured Van't Hoff factor of 1.9. Magnesium sulfate is made up of two ions, magnesium and sulfate. So we would expect it to have a Van't Hoff factor of two, but it actually has a lower Van't Hoff factor of 1.3. Um, and so on and so forth. So we can look at different salts and we can say what their sort of ideal Van't Hoff factor, the expected, we can also call this um, the ideal Van't Hoff factor, all right? If they completely dissociate, if, if they 100% of the magnesium chloride units completely dissociated, then we would have three particles in solution. But in reality, some of those ions still stick together. So like something like, you know, 97% of the magnesium chloride dissociates, but some of the magnesium and chlor chloride ions are still sticking together and forming a single particle. So that's why the measured Van't Hoff factor is lower than what we expect it to be a lot of times. So for electrolyte solutions, we have to add the Van't Hoff factor to our calculations for the first three colligative properties, uh, or sorry, for the last three colligative properties. So for a change in temperature of the boiling point, all right, it's I times molality times the, the um, boiling point constant. For freezing point, I times molality times freezing point constant. And for osmotic pressure, I times MRT. So we do want to know the identity the the we said that colligative properties, it doesn't matter the type of molecule, it just matters the number of particles. Um, but it does sort of matter the type because we would need to know is it an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte because not because electrolytes result in more particles and the Van't Hoff factor just accounts for that. So here's a quick concept check question. And it says, which aqueous solution has the highest boiling point? All right, all of these have the same concentration of 0.5 molar. And we know that boiling point elevation 
the higher the concentration, the higher the boiling point will be. But these all have the same concentration, but they are different substances. So this one is a non-electrolyte. It's just a, it's a covalent compound and covalent compounds for the most part do not dissociate. So this one is our non-electrolyte. This one is an ionic compound and so is this one. Sodium chloride will dissociate into sodium and chloride ions, so two. And calcium fluoride will dissociate into calcium and two fluoride ions, so three particles. All right, so the highest boiling point is gonna be the one with the most particles dissolved in solution. So that will be C, the calcium fluoride. All right, here's a, a question involving the Van Hoff factor. It actually asks us to calculate the Van Hoff factor for an aqueous solution of calcium chloride at each of the following concentrations. So in this case, it's giving us molality and it's giving us the change in freezing point. So the molality and the change in freezing point. And we can use that to calculate the Van Hoff factor, the actual Van Hoff factor. So um, let's do that for each of these. So if we have, um, what do I wanna do? Okay, the change, let's write out this formula. The change in freezing point is the molality, oops, in this case, it's gonna be the Van Hoff factor times the molality times the um, KB, the freezing point. These are aqueous solutions. So our KB is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molality. All right, so I'm just going to rearrange this equation here. Nope. We'll do it over here. Okay. I'm just, this is me rearranging it so that I can solve for I. Ah, I'm using it this time to solve, to solve for the Van Hoff factor. It's a variable that we can solve for. It's just another variable. So that's going to be, if I rearrange this equation to solve for I, it will look like this. So now I can figure out what the Van Hoff factor is for each of these three different solutions. So the first one is zero, the molality, oops. I wanna do the change in temperature on top. Change in temperature is 0 0.110 degrees Celsius divided by the molality. times the KB, or sorry, it's KF. 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. And for the second one, it's gonna be 0 0.440 degrees Celsius over 0 0.0910 all times 1.86 and for the third one 1.33 degrees Celsius over 0 0.278 times 1.86 all right if we do all the math we end up with oops I didn't do it in my notes so I gotta do it I'm gonna do it live except I don't have my phone. Here's my calculator. Okay. Do, 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 do. Point one, one divided by point oh two, two, five divided by one point eight six equals 2.63 and the next one 0.44 divided by 0 
nine one divided by one point eight six equals two point six zero and then the last one one point three three divided by point two seven eight divided by one point eight six equals two point five seven all right so i want you to notice the trend here these are three different solutions of the same thing they're all calcium chloride solutions but they are different concentrations all right so the molality is increasing as we go down this list but the van hoff factor is increasing as we go up this list all right the van hoff factor is higher in more dilute solutions all right the lower the concentration the higher the van hoff factor i okay and that's because again the reason the van hoff factor is not a perfect three um it's not an ideal three is because some of those calcium and chloride ions find each other in solution and stick together and the more calcium and chloride ions are in solution in other words the higher the concentration the more likely they are to find each other and form uh and you know and, and pair up so that's why the van hoff factor gets smaller and smaller as the as the um, concentration of the solution gets higher and higher so that's just a, like a concept check to know all right practice problem here um let's calculate the freezing point and this one's going to be a doozy calculate the freezing point of a 2.5 molar solution of magnesium chloride in water assuming complete dissociation and ideal solution behavior okay so what that is telling us assuming complete dissociation that means assume that the magnesium chloride completely dissociates into magnesium and chloride ions. In other words, assume, oops, assume that the Van Hoff factor I is three. Exactly, okay? Um, and it tells us that we have a 2.5 molar solution and it gives us a density. All right, so um, I know I wanna calculate the freezing point. That's what it's asking me for. Calculate the freezing point. Question mark, that's what I'm trying to find. All right, so I'm gonna need this equation here. And since it's an electrolyte, I need to add that Van Hoff factor, I. Um, it gives me, let's see what I have. So I always have this, this is a constant I can look up. Um, and I have the Van Hoff factor because it told me to assume that it completely dissociates. So we're assuming it's three. I don't have molality. All right, so what is molality? Molality is moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. And I guess I can specify here for this problem. In this problem, our solute is the magnesium chloride and the solvent is water. So what do I have in that department? Neither, I don't have either of those. I'm given molarity. So I'm gonna go ahead and write the equation for that one as well. Molarity is moles of solute, in this case, magnesium chloride, over liters of solution. And I'm not given that information either. 
I need to go from molarity to molality. And if I'm doing that, I can just pick a volume, all right? So it doesn't matter what the volume is or what the amount of solution is that I have. So this is one of those problems where I'm just going to pick an amount. And I like to pick, I'm gonna pick one liter in this case. So that's another assumption I get to make here. I'm gonna say that we have one liter of solution. Okay, so if we have one liter of solution, all right, and I'm given the molarity, all right, I can figure out how many moles of magnesium chloride we have. So I'm gonna do that first. So that's gonna be my step one. So step one, something I can solve for, the moles. So the molarity is 2.5 molar, and I have decided that we have one liter. All right, so I'm solving for moles of solute, and that's just gonna be an easy peasy, 2.5 moles of magnesium chloride. Sweet, so now I can plug that in here. All right, so now I have my moles of that, but I still need my kilograms of water. All right, and that I can find with a little bit of math, so that's what we're gonna do next. We need to solve for kilograms of water. And we have a density, so that tells me we can, fi we can figure out the mass of the solution um, using the density. So we have one liter of solution. So one liter is um, same thing as a thousand milliliters. And since I'm my density is in milliliters, I'm gonna convert that. So the volume that I have of the solution is a thousand milliliters times 1.04 grams per milliliter gives me a total mass of solution 104. Oh, yes. I did that slightly wrong in my notes, but. All right, so that's how many grams of solution we have, okay? But we need the kilograms of water. So to find out how much of that is water, we need to subtract the mass of the magnesium chloride. And we don't know the mass of the magnesium chloride, but we can figure it out because we know the moles of magnesium chloride. So 2.5 moles of magnesium chloride um, divided by the molar, or actually, sorry, times the molar mass of magnesium chloride, which we look at the periodic table and we determine it to be 95.2 grams per mole, and we get, um, what's the mass, is 237.9 grams of magnesium chloride. So we're gonna subtract that from the mass of our solution, and I have to type this in my calculator, 1040 minus 237.9, that's an extra sig fig. I don't need it, so I'm gonna drop it. So I'm just gonna call it 802 grams of water. That's the proportion of the solution that's water. So now I have kilograms of water. I can solve for molality. This is gonna be sort of step three, third thing I'm doing here. Um, molality is going to be the moles of magnesium chloride over the kilograms of water. And the moles we calculated up here, 2.5 moles. And the kilograms of water we just calculated here, 802 grams, but we need it in kilograms. So I'm gonna divide by a thousand and call that kilograms. So our molality is three, oops, nope, I gotta type this in. 2.5 divided by 0 0.802 equals 3.12.
molal. So now I finally have the molality that I can solve for the change in temperature. It's the molality, 3.12 times the freezing point constant of water, which we know from previous problems is 1.86. So our change in temperature is 18.2 degrees Celsius. That's our change in temperature, but we want to know, I said we wanted to know the change in temperature here, but that's wrong. We wanted to know the freezing point. So what we were actually, what we're, what we're trying to find is the freezing point. God. The freezing point. And the freezing point is, of water normally is zero degrees Celsius. Um, so if we subtract 18.2, we get a new freezing point of negative 18.2 degrees Celsius. This is our freezing point of a 2.5 molar solution of magnesium chloride. And magnesium chloride is one of the salts that's used to melt snow like on sidewalks and stuff. Um, it's beneficial to use salts that have a higher Van Hoff factor than say table salt, sodium chloride, because they drop the freezing point lower. All right, then this is sort of an addendum or whatever, it's a continuation of the same problem. If the measured freezing point of the solution is negative 16.4, then what is the measured Van Hoff factor? All right, so if this is the equation for the change in freezing point. All right, and we get a change, a measured change in freezing point of negative 16.4 or the new freezing point is six, sorry. So the new freezing point of the solution is 16.4, but we know that the normal freezing point is, um, is zero. So that means that the change in freezing point is positive 16.4 degrees Celsius. All right, then we have the information we need to solve for the actual Van Hoff factor. We know the temperature here we know the molality because we just calculated that in that problem, so we can use it. And we know the um, freezing point constant. So I'm just going to rearrange this equation to solve for I, the Van Hoff factor. The I we used in the previous problem was 3. We said that we could assume... <gasps> no, I didn't! I didn't use it. I totally forgot it. Where is my equation? Down here. Um, number four, step four, okay? I for, I just did my molality times my um, freezing point constant. So if this was I, I forgot my three here. Forgot my three, okay. So we're just gonna update these numbers here gonna be three times 18.2. That's gonna be pretty significant. 18.2 times three is just what I'm gonna do. 54.6, y'all. 54.6 degrees Celsius minus 54.6 degrees Celsius negative 54.6 degrees Celsius. So 2.5 solution, 2.5 molar solution of magnesium chloride is probably not even gonna freeze outside in the Adirondacks in winter. It's pretty, pretty low temperature there. Um, so since I made up this second problem, I'm gonna adjust this a little to be a little bit less ridiculous. So instead of saying negative 16.4, we're gonna say negative 46. Let's call it negative 46.4, okay? And now we wanna calculate what is the actual Van Hoff factor. 
So our change in temperature, oh, I'm rearranging this equation here. And that is delta Tf over M molality times the freezing point constant. And that's going to be 46.4 degrees Celsius divided by the molality, which is 3.12. And the freezing point constant, 1.86, 46.4 divided by 3.12 divided by 1.86. No, that's not right. I got eight. And now I'm thinking I did just make up these numbers. So we might just need to scrap that problem. Oh, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not willing to re-film uh, this whole thing and I have to keep making these mistakes. Okay, so I forgot to put the three right here in my calculation, but I did in my notes. So three times 3.12 times 1.86 is in fact 18.2. I had that right. Um, 18.2 was the right answer and hopefully I haven't confused you too much. Put these numbers back and uh, our new freezing point is our old freezing point of negative 18.2 degrees Celsius. Okay and so if I just go with the number I had in this problem originally and say that our change in temperature here is 16.4 degrees Celsius. All right, then our Van Hoff factor that we calculate ends up being 2.70. And that number makes sense, not eight that I was getting before. Okay, so I hope that this little um, fumble on my half is also lets you know that even I don't solve problems perfectly the first time, even when I have my freaking notes in front of me that I'm supposed to be copying from, okay? So sometimes you get a weird answer and it just means that you did something wrong and that's when you have to just kind of go back through your work and see where did I go wrong? And I figured out that I went wrong in this problem. Originally, I forgot to put that three there. Okay, I, re I remembered that I forgot my Van Hoff factor, but I overcorrected my work, okay? So this is probably, I just actually made up this number, but it was probably a pretty close guess to the real thing. So I think this is about what the Van Hoff factor is for magnesium chloride. Um, so that is the end of this lecture. The last page that I have is just some convenient tables for you to reference. This is straight from the textbook. Uh, so it's got the normal boiling point for a few different solvents. All of the solvents we worked with in this lecture were we always used aqueous solutions with water, but you could have other solvents. You could have solutions with other solvents and then we would need to use different boiling points and different um, uh, freezing freezing point constants and boiling point constants. And then 
I just made this little handy dandy cheat sheet for you of the colligative properties, the definition of colligative properties, and then the four different colligative properties, vapor pressure lowering, boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, osmotic pressure, and the formulas that we use for each. And of course, for um, the last three, we use a, a slightly different formula. If it's a non-electrolyte versus if it's an electrolyte, we just add that Van Hoff factor. Don't forget when you're doing boiling point elevation calculations that you calculate the change in boiling point and then you add it to the normal boiling point. And when we're calculating freezing point depression, we calculate the change in freezing point and then we subtract it from the normal freezing point. So that's the end of this lecture.